On the 9th of December 2025, a press release from Huntington Ingalls Industries and Babcock International Group quietly heralded a shift in naval construction. The announcement that the Babcock facility in Rossi, Scotland would manufacture complex hull assemblies for the United States Navy's Virginia-class Block 6 nuclear-powered attack submarines marks the first time in the history of the US nuclear submarine program that major structural fabrication work for an active SSN class has been outsourced to a foreign entity. For observers of naval history and the special relationship, this is not merely a contract, it is a crossing of the Rubicon. Since the passing of the 1958 US-UK Mutual Defence Agreement, our nations have shared nuclear propulsion technology, strategic weapon systems and intelligence. Yet the physical construction of the hulls, the steel pressure vessels that separate the crew from the crushing depths of the ocean, remain a sovereign endeavour, jealously guarded by domestic industrial bases. The decision to forward sections of the premier American hunter-killer submarine in a Scottish dockyard signifies a transition from an alliance of cooperation to an alliance of production. It is a tangible manifestation of the AUKUS Pillar 1 ambition to create a unified transatlantic submarine industrial base capable of meeting the aggressive expansion required to counter emerging threats in the Indo-Pacific, i.e. China. To understand why the US Navy, historically protective of its bi-American shipbuilding laws, is turning to Scotland, we must look at the brutal arithmetic of the current submarine production crisis. The United States Navy has set a force level goal of 66 nuclear-powered attack submarines to maintain global presence and deterrence. However, the current inventory sits at approximately 50 boats, and is projected to decline to 46 by 2030, as the Cold War era Los Angeles class boats retire faster than the new Virginia class boats can be commissioned. The US industrial base, comprising General Dynamics Electric Boats and Huntington Ingall Industries Newport News Shipbuilding, is currently tasked with 2 plus 1 production cadence. That's two Virginia class attack submarines and one Columbia class ballistic missile submarine per year. This is an output rate not seen since the height of the Cold War, and frankly, the system is straining. Despite billions in investment, the actual delivery rate for Virginia class submarines has hovered around 1.2 to 1.3 boats per year over the last five years. The Columbia class, carrying the nation's strategic nuclear deterrence, has brick one priority. If a welder or a specialised machine is needed for Columbia, it is pulled from the Virginia line, creating delays. The AUKUS agreement adds a massive new variable to this equation. Under Pillar 1, the US has agreed to sell three to five Virginia-class submarines to Australia in the early 2030s. If US shipbuilding output remains at current levels, selling three boats to Australia would effectively cannibalise the US Navy's own fleet. To make AUKUS viable, the US must raise production to at least 2.33 boats per year. This is where the UK enters the frame. By offloading the fabrication of large, complex steel structures, specifically the Virginia payload module, or associated hull sections, to Babcock Rosyth, the US shipyards can treat the Scottish Yard as an extension of its own facilities. This distributed manufacturing model allows US yards to focus on final assembly and reactor integration, while the heavy fabrication is handled by their British partners. The submarines that will utilise British manufacturing are one of the most advanced attack platforms ever designed for the United States. The Virginia Block 6 is a transformative leap in underwater capability, centred around the Virginia payload module. The original Virginia class was designed as a post-Cold War warrior. The Block 5 and Block 6 designs, however, pivot back to great power competition. The defining feature is the Virginia payload module. An 84 foot, approximately 26 meters, section of the hull inserted amidships, increasing the sub's length to 460 feet, which is about 140 meters, 
and its submerged displacement to over 10,200 tonnes. This extension houses four large 87-inch vertical launch tubes. Each tube holds a seven-shooter canister of Tomahawk land attack missiles. This triples the submarine strike capacity from 12 Tomahawks in the bow vertical launch cells to 40 missiles in total in vertical launch tubes. This massive increase in firepower is designed to replace the strike capacity of the Ohio guided missile submarines retiring in the late 2020s. But Block 6 is about more than just missile hauling. The 10th of December press release highlights a focus on seabed warfare. Modern naval strategy is increasingly concerned with the infrastructure that lies on the ocean floor, fiber optic cables and energy pipelines. Block 6 is engineered to dominate this domain. The large VPM tubes can be adapted to launch and recover unmanned underwater vehicles without the submarine surfacing, allowing these drones to inspect or disrupt seabed infrastructure. Additionally, the 87-inch diameter of the VPM tubes is sized to accommodate future conventional prompt strike hypersonic missiles. These weapons travel at speeds exceeding Mach 5, providing a capability to strike time-critical targets deep inside enemy territory. Rossyth Dockyard has seen a remarkable renaissance. Once the refitting base for the Royal Navy's nuclear fleet, it is now one of the most advanced naval manufacturing sites in Europe. Its resurgence began with the assembly of the Queen Elizabeth class aircraft carriers and the installation of the iconic Goliath crane. Following the carriers, the shipyard secured the Type 31 frigate contract, introducing the Venture Assembly Hall. The December 2025 announcement validates the strategy of investing in Rothschild's dual-use capability. Babcock has already been manufacturing missile tube assemblies for the common missile compartment, shared by the UK Dreadnought and the US Columbia classes. This existing work provided the proof of concept that convinced the US Navy that Rothschild could handle the VPM work. This deal supports over 20,000 British jobs and utilises advanced manufacturing facilities, leveraging automated welding and digital twin technology to ensure that the modules match the digital designs held in Newport News perfectly. Babcock is the integrator, but the supply chain reaches deeper into the industrial heartlands of both nations. A critical player is Sheffield Forge Masters. Located in South Yorkshire, this company is a titan of heavy engineering and one of the few in the world capable of pouring and forging the colossal steel components required for nuclear submarine pressure hulls. Since being nationalised by the UK Ministry of Defence in 2021, over £400 million has been invested to recapitalise the forge. Crucially, Sheffield Forge Masters is already a qualified supplier to the US Navy, having won contracts to supply castings for the Virginia and Columbia programs. Recent financial reports highlight a 100% increase in orders, driven by UK and US defence needs. When Babcock builds a VPM module, the steel casting for the bulkhead likely originated in the furnaces of Sheffield. The decision to build 84-foot, 1,000-ton hull sections in Scotland for a submarine assembled in Virginia creates a monumental logistical challenge. These are not ISO containers, they are non-divisible loads of extreme sensitivity. The movement of such massive structures requires specialised marine assets. General Dynamics electric boat operate a purpose-built ocean transport barge, the Holland, to move modules between its US facilities. For the transatlantic route, heavy lift ships could be required. The journey involves navigating the North Sea and the North Atlantic. The modules must be welded to the deck to withstand the G-forces in the storm, complying with strict US Departments of Defense regulations. This logistical chain effectively extends the assembly line across 3,500 miles of ocean, turning the Atlantic 
into an industrial conveyor belt linking the River Forth to the James River in Virginia. This contract is a stepping stone. The ultimate destination is the SSN AUKUS, the next generation submarine that will be operated by both the Royal Navy and the Royal Australian Navy. The SSN AUKUS will be based on a British design but will incorporate substantial US technology, including the vertical launch system. By building Virginia VPM sections now, Babcock is gaining experience with the Pacific US VLS technologies that will be installed in SSN AUKUS. This de-risks the future program and ensures that the Royal Navy, the US Navy and the Royal Australian Navy submarines will be able to fire the same pool of weapons. Tomahawks, CPS hypersonic missiles and the future anti-ship missiles. By the late 2030s, the AUKUS vision will see a tripartite fleet, the UK operating Astute and SSN AUKUS, the US operating Virginia Block 5 and Block 6, as well as SSN-X, and Australia operating Virginia class and SSN AUKUS. The 2025 decision to build the Virginia payload modules in the UK is a pivotal moment. It recognises a hard truth of 21st century deterrence. No single nation, however powerful, can sustain an underwater dominance and loan. The scale, complexity and urgency of nuclear submarine production now demands the pooled resources of the world's leading naval powers. For the United States, this is a cold-eyed, practical fix for a critical production bottleneck. One that helps prevent AUKUS from becoming a strategic promise it cannot physically deliver. For the United Kingdom, it returns Ross Scythe and Sheffield to the heart of global naval manufacturing. Ensuring British steel and engineering are embedded in the most capable submarines ever put to sea. As heavy lift ships begin their transatlantic shuttle, carrying those grey steel cylinders across the ocean, they will be moving more than hardware. They will be carrying the future balance of undersea power, forged not by only one nation, but by an alliance that understands the stakes. So, is this the blueprint for future defence? Shared industrial sovereignty as the price for credible deterrence? Or does it carry risks we're not talking about enough? Let us know what you think in the comments below. Thanks for watching.